Thank you, Apostle. It's my pleasure to welcome you. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Great, glorious morning, everyone. Amen. Amen. As our morning is good, our ministry will be good. And as every morning we wake up and we say this, the day the Lord has made, I'll be glad and rejoice in it. Great morning, great ministry. Amen. We depend upon the grace of God. And you know, sometimes some people cannot even wake up because, uh, you know, they had that in the night and that in the night. But you know, for us, the grace of God comes. Even when your body is saying, am I getting up? The grace comes and lifts you up. Amen. And you have a gracious morning, a gracious ministry. Amen. You know, every moment the Lord is with us. As we're here, he is with us. And as we're finishing, uh, we're concluding today, and we're going out every step of your way, every day of your week, every month of your year, the Lord will be with you. And you carry those words with you. Good, great, gracious. Father, we thank you. I will magnify you because of your love, because of your ministers. These are your ambassadors. And you have come here, we have come here, and you have come with us. And so that will be quick for the ministry. We pray, Lord, everything we still need, you pass on to everyone in Jesus' name. Make our ministries good, great, glorious gracious in Jesus name thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray God has blessed you you can sit down today we're coming to the conclusion of the ministers and professionals conference and today we're looking at the explicit mandate of ministering faith till the end explicit there's no shadow of doubt what he wants us to do what he has called us to do and what he has anointed appointed for us to do is very clear explicit it's a mandate it's a decree it's a word we cannot turn upside down it's a word we cannot take anything from it's a word he has given us and it's a mandate. And when we go to the field, we're not going and asking the people, what do you want me to tell you? What do you want me to teach you? No, we already have the mandate. We have the mandate from Christ, the commandment from Christ, the great commission from Christ, and it is explicit enough of ministering. We're not there to talk anything, say any other thing. We're there as ministers. Am I right? And when the driver drives and the minister must minister. And the one who has been sent by the Lord were to represent the Lord. We're not representing a tribe. We're not representing a locality. We're not representing a denomination. We are there to represent the Lord he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the King of kings and the Lord of laws. He is the Redeemer. And he sends us forth to represent him. They're like the ambassadors of a country that go to the country. And they're representing their country. Whatever the culture of that country, they don't follow that culture. And whatever, when those countries, when they have their holidays, they said it's their holiday, the ambassador represents his his own country, the ambassador of Christ represents Christ. He doesn't represent this, um, you know, denomination, that denomination. I come here, well, it's good, you know, somebody must have a name, somebody must have an address is coming from, a locality is coming from. Uh, they say you are from a Kenwa Road or something. Well, but you are not a Kenwa because, you know, that, that's the location. They say you are coming from deeper life. You say the general superintendent of this and that, that's all right. We have to introduce somebody and give a 
name but I didn't come here in the name of deeper life I came to represent Christ and I came to tell you the mandate that he has given the explicit mandate of ministering faith we're ministering faith we don't minister doubt some people read the Bible and they say Peter said uh, is it Peter that said the Holy Ghost inspired Peter to say that God said when the Bible says something it's God saying that and if they say what well, Solomon said well I understand but it's God that gave the word and the wisdom to Solomon it's God and we build up faith in God and that's the reason why we're here from the beginning of our ministry to the very end we're ministering faith and it says till the end I will go on till the end I will go on till the end I'm sure you've heard they asked me the question and he said are you about to retire I said retire I'm going till the end somebody there I'm going till the end you know in the different religious circles they have their own principles, they have their own tradition, and they have their own uh, administration. And they will tell you, now you've reached this age, now you retire. Now, that's your denomination, that's your administration. If you're an evangelist, at that time, uh, when they say you retire, the Lord does not take away from you the ministry of the evangelist. You retire denomination but you go on firing on until the end. They bring, you know, all those things. That's what they did. They, they do in the world. You know, they, they say that at this age, at 65, at 70, you retire. Get out of that seat. Somebody is waiting already. And if you don't live there, they will push you out because the next person must be there. That's why they retire. It comes to their turn. But in the case of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, look at Peter there until the end. Look at Paul there until the end. Look at Timothy there until the end. And I look at you today and I pray that a fresh anointing will come upon your life. A new power will come upon your life. Hey, don't, well, don't, maybe you're sitting down now. You know, sometimes we'll stand up, sometimes we'll stand, just like I'm standing now and you're sitting down, but your sitting down is preparation, preparation for launching out. You will go on till the end in Jesus' name. The topic today, the explicit man uh, mandate of ministering faith till the end. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 10 and we're looking at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. In verse 23 it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Our faith. Why? Because he who has called you and he who has appointed you is faithful. That promise. Join those two words together. Our faith is faithfulness. What is faith? Faith is believing that God is faithful. As he promised, he'll fulfill it. As he giving you an assignment, it will make sure you carry out the assignment. Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. Man's faith in the faithfulness of God. Think about that. Think about that. A sinner is coming. Are you going to be saved? Yes, I'll be saved. Why? I have faith in the faithfulness of the Savior. 
If, if a sick person is coming, do you believe you are going to be healed? Yes. Why? I have faith in the faithfulness of the healer. Here is a downtrodden person and uh, he is a slave to everything. But he comes for redemption, my friend. Do you believe you are going to be redeemed? Yes. I have faith in the faithfulness of the redeemer. He wonder, are you, why are you here? Because this is my way to get to heaven. How do you believe you are going to get to heaven? I have faith in the faithfulness of the one who has made a mansion for me over there. Faith and faithfulness. Anytime you come to the Lord, you understand, he will answer my prayer. He'll give me joy. He'll give me peace. He will turn my life around for the better. Why? Because I have faith in the faithfulness of him who has promised. And that's why we're here today. I just want to remind you that we have this explicit uh, mandate we have the faith, we give the faith. We believe in the Lord and we call other people to the believe on the Lord and we're doing that every day. We never operate in unbelief. We never operate in fear. We never operate in faithfulness. We never operate in faltering and we're shaking. We cannot shake. Why? Because the one who is faithful is so firm, is so solid and we know that all the power powers on earth are not equal to the power of the faithful one who has called you and he will see you through there are three things we're going to look at number one we're looking at the preaching and profession of faith in the faithful number two we're looking at the pattern and proclamation of faith in its fullness we, we don't only you know talk about faith in a you know in a little sector section of the word of god in the fullness of the word of god what he has promised he will do in its fullness we are facing that and we look at the pattern we look at the proclamation number three is our perseverance and in possession of faith in the finisher, in the finisher. You know, some people say, I am now, I believe in the Lord. How am I going to finish well? Faith in the finisher. The author and the finisher of our faith. He is the author, he is the origin. He has started something good in your life. It will continue. There's no fear. Maybe there'll be an obstacle in the way. Maybe there'll be a hurdle in the way and something will stop me. Uh-uh, you're unstoppable. Yeah. If he is unstoppable, you are unstoppable. Yeah. If he is the one that started the faith in you, you know, unfinished product, men have unfinished product they start this they cannot finish they start that they cannot finish but not christ he has started with your life he's molding you he's mending you he's mentoring you and what he has started he will finish maybe today you are an unfinished product there's no problem because he's still working on you I said, the Lord is still working on you. Yeah. Somebody looks at you and he says, uh uh, madam, uh uh, sir, that's how you are. You need to see me about 10 years ago. I'm not what I used to be. Say that to yourself. <laughs> and the Lord is still at work, He has not finished. And you can go away and when he finishes you can come back you'll see something you never saw in your life before yeah. he's on walking he's walking in your life and he has started and he will he will finish strong he will finish well and when i look at you after he has worked on you i'll be surprised this brother so and so that sister so and so that's minita so and so and you'll be a wonder to the people around you in jesus name we're looking at number two number two uh, sorry number one is the preaching and the profession of 
faith in the faithful. Faith in the faithful. It tells us uh, we're going to divide this to three parts. Number one, we're looking at the profession with full assurance of faith. Number two is the preaching by faithful ambassadors of the foundation. Number three is the perdition for fatal abandonment of the faith. Fatal abandonment of the faith. You may not abandon the ministry, but if you abandon the faith for the ministry, fatal. You may not abandon, you know, worship and coming every Sunday and doing this and that. But if you abandon the faith in the worship, that is fatal. You will not abandon. Yeah. And God will not abandon you. Yeah. Look at number one. Number one is the profession with full assurance of faith. It tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, I'm reading there from verse 7, then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Christ came uh, to do the will of God. My salvation is the will of God. That's what he came to do. My healing is the will of God. That's what he came to do. My growth is the will of God. That's what he came to do. My perfection is the will of God. That is what he came to do. And he will do it well in your life. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, Thou wouldest not, neither art thou pleasure therein, Which are offered by the law, neither do you have a pleasure in what was offered by the law. By the law. That's the Old Testament. And you see all those uh, people in the Old Testament. They are bringing this sacrifice. Bringing that sacrifice. And it didn't touch them. It didn't purify them. It didn't make their lives better. And God says, yes, I ordained it. But it's not producing the result. I don't have pleasure in that anymore. Uh, you know, religion. There are people that they do not read the whole Bible. Uh, you understand? Whenever you buy a book, many people, when you read your book, the book you have bought, you start from chapter 1. If you get to the middle of that chapter 2, you have tried. They don't go to the end of the book. How many books have you got? How many books have you started reading? And you read chapter 1, chapter 2, and then uh, you put it on the shelf. And now one year has gone, you have not touched that book. There are many people, they come to religion, they read Genesis and Exodus, and they cannot go beyond that. They read Leviticus, they cannot go beyond that. When you go on reading, and go on reading, and you come to this, and it says all those Old Testament, uh, all the Old Testament uh, sacrifices, it has no pleasure in them. And then in verse 9, in verse 9, it tells us, Then said I, Lo, I come. To do thy will, O God. I come, he came to the earth. He came over here on earth. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And, uh, you know, when he came, there were people that have not understood. Uh, the Pharisees did not understand. Sadducees did not understand. Religious leaders in Israel did not understand. Nicodemus did not understand. Are you a ruler in Israel and you don't understand? And the leper did not understand. That's why the leper said, if it be thy will, you can make me whole. You can cleanse me. There are people that take their prayer pattern from the leper. The leper that did not know that he has come. He came to save. He came to heal. He came to deliver. And when they want to pray, they come and chapter 8 of Matthew where the leper said if it be the will is so far away from Calvary chapter 8 is so far away from the cross is so far away from the time Jesus said it is finished and you know they say pray like you know that leper if it be the will save me of 
course, he came to do the will of God. If it be thy will, heal me, of course, he came to do the will of God. If it be thy will, sanctify me. Sanctification is the will of God. And Jesus said, lo, behold, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. He taketh away the first. What's that? The first covenant. The old covenant. All those sacrifices. Bring goats and bring sheep and bring fowl and bring turtle dove and bring this and that. He taketh away the first so that he can establish the second. He taketh away the first. All the activities of the first Adam that he did and brought us into sin, into slavery, into sickness, into satanic dominion. He taketh away the first and now the second, the last Adam. He has come and what he has now given us is good salvation, total salvation, is perfect salvation, wonderful salvation and total healing and total deliverance he has given you now. And in your life, you'll not go back to the first, the first sacrifice, the, the second sacrifice, the, the final sacrifice. You're not going back to the old covenant. You're now in the new covenant. And it says, he has now established the second. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it says, by the which will. I come to do thy will, O God. By that will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Once for all. Some religious people, they say, whenever they take the sacrament, whenever they take the Holy Communion, they say that they are having the sacrifice of Jesus again. And they are taking of the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus again. No, no. Because he gave the sacrifice and the offering once for all. That's why many people are deceived. Because um, they want uh, healing, they want deliverance, and they come to the prophet, the prophet who has not come into the New Testament, and they say, prophet, prophet, I want to wash away all my demon, all my, you know, de de dis destruction, and they say, come, and they say, they follow them to the riverside, and Mr. Prophet, a man, is uh, washing by himself, is washing uh, Madame Sickness uh, at the river. No wonder they commit sin or the outcome. Even David that uh, did not see was not washing Bathsheba. Just look outside the window and saw Bathsheba washing herself committed adultery and murder. How about the Mr. Prophet that takes the woman and undresses the woman and is washing the woman at the riverside? Those are not prophets of God. They're still back in, even in the old covenant, they didn't do that to wash a woman by the riverside. I'm sure you will not do that. But the sacrifice of Christ, once for all, it has now been totally done and it is by that we are sanctified. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering he did that on the cross and no more. But now we are made perfect through that sanctification look at verse 15 in verse 15 whereof the holy ghost also is a witness to us for after that he had said before verse 16 what did he say this is the covenant that i will make with them after those days says the lord i will put my laws into their hearts Give me a good amen. amen. People have, um, you know, the Ten Commandments and they put it on the wall. 
but you are not looking at that every time and then you go out you cannot see that they put uh, the Ten Commandments, you know, it's very beautifully printed, and they put it there, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And uh, when they go out, they're not seeing that thing on the wall. The thing that the wall uh, paper said, thou shalt not, they do. But God said it's not effective to put those laws and those commandments on the wall, on the door, anywhere but now. I will put my laws into their heart. And you carry that with you everywhere. And the reader, your conscience is reminding you, look at this law, look at this law. And you cannot say, I forgot, because it's written upon your heart. And in their minds, will I write them. It's a new day. It's a new dispensation. It's a new covenant. And the Lord effected your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to, we're coming to number two here. Number two is the preaching by faithful ambassadors of the foundation. The preaching by faithful ambassadors of the foundation. He says we're preaching the foundation. We're preaching the founder. We're preaching the finisher of our faith. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Looking at verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me. Hold on. According to the grace of God which is given unto me at salvation it's by grace. The rest of our lives in the ministry is also by grace. By grace. God, God's riches, abundant and complete and is extensive, giving unto us at salvation, grace. At sanctification, grace. In service, grace. There are people in service, they leave the grace of God and they minister in the energy of the flesh. The minister in the uh, attitude of the flesh. They leave the grace of God apart and with a physical, natural uh, attitude, they minister and it doesn't work. And they so labor without grace. And the labor is a graceless labor. And the activity is a graceless activity. Now, grace will not be angry at the congregation. Grace will not be angry at the backslider. Grace will not fight on the pulpit. Grace will not knock, will not knock somebody there where you're preaching. When we're saved, it's all by grace. And when we're sanctified, it's all by grace. And as we come to serve the Lord in any capacity, there's no pride in grace. And there is no anger in grace. There's no self-will in grace. There's no browbeating, beating other people to submission by grace. Grace does not do that. Here Paul the Apostle said, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Grace makes us wise. Self makes us unwise, foolish. Personal ability and the personal aggressiveness, it makes us foolish, but it's the grace that makes us, like it made Paul, a wise master builder. He said, I have laid the foundation and know the builders thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. How is he going to take heed by grace. Our forerunners, the ones who went before us, they did it all by grace. And Christ came to reveal grace unto us and the fullness of grace. As we're built thereupon, we're building in by the grace of God. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. When you are building the foundation, the foundation is Jesus Christ. And you are preaching the, in the faithfulness 
of the foundation. You are not replacing Christ with yourself. Listen to me. This is who I am. This my church is gone astray. In the church of Jesus Christ. And he says, upon this rock I will build my church. And when you are in grace, you understand this is his church. And we handle that delicately. And we handle that wisely. And we handle that as representatives of Christ. And we're still building that same foundation, Christ. And we don't allow our gifts, our talents, our popularity to carry us away. And now we're talking about myself, myself. For the foundation can no man lay than that which is laid already, which is Jesus Christ. Christ. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, now, if any man build upon this foundation, how is he going to build upon the foundation? Is doing it by grace. I'm not qualified for this. This is not my family property. I'm not qualified to handle this. I am here as I was saved by grace. I also serve by grace. And the Lord will be happy with such a person. And every grace we need. And every strength we need. Every power we need. He'll give unto us in Jesus name. But you know in the church. When the people fear the man, the minister, more than uh, they fear God, they love Christ, and more than they yielded to the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, there's no more grace there. Uh, that man is the authority, is the power. And once he stands, just look at him standing alone, you begin to tremble. And once he looks at you and he says whatever he says and whatever he's used to saying, the people fear him. Uh, they don't say, don't do that because the grace of Christ forbids us to do that. They say, don't do that. If the pastor hears you did that, you are in trouble. We don't, you will never get in trouble with Christ. We will never get in trouble with the grace of God when joy is smile, when joy is love. But the man or the woman that wants to keep us in slavery, whatever they do, and their posture is like we tremble and we fear them. There's no church there. There's no ministry there. It's the grace of God that helps us and we build precious things like gold and silver and precious stone. Those who build wood, hay and stubble that will be burnt off because they do it without grace. We will have the grace of God. I will have the grace of God. Anytime you come to minister and you see that Grace is leaked out. The grace is not there. The goodness of the Lord is not there. The riches of the kingdom, not there. The abundance of the kingdom is not there. And the cross of Christ is not there. And the emancipation of the Lord by the Lord alone, and you have the joy in presenting Emmanuel, the emancipator before them. If all that is not there, why don't you just go back to your closet? Why don't you go back uh, to your chamber and say, Lord, I need grace. I cannot minister to these people in anger. I cannot minister with boisterousness. I cannot minister with that hard kind of you know word i'm speaking to them i need grace it'll give you more grace and that grace will be sufficient for you in jesus name we're looking at second timothy chapter 2 and i'm reading there from verse 19 foundation foundation nevertheless the foundation of god standeth sure we're building a on the foundation. The ambassadors of Christ are to build on the foundation. And it says, The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ 
depart from iniquity. You know, when it's by grace, it's easy to depart from iniquity. The grace of God lifts you up and helps you and it says, get up. This is not your place. You are better than this. You are higher than this. And the grace comes you'll depart from iniquity. But when you leave the grace of God alone and you're doing it by yourself, I will not do this. I will not say this. I will not go there. I will not move there. When it's by your strength, it's difficult, difficult to break the habit that had been with you for 30, 40 years. 50 years or more. But when it is by grace, everyone that names the name of Christ can easily depart from iniquity. And somebody shout, Amen. <laughs> We're looking at number three here. Number three is the perdition for fatal abandonment of the faith. The perdition. For fatal abandonment of faith. And you see, there are people that uh, think that I'm saved, I'm forever saved. That's condition there. If you abide, you're saved, forever saved. If you remain, you're saved, forever saved. But you know, we have our free will. A free will. And that free will operates every time. Do you understand? I breathe in, breathe out. That's my free will. If I don't want to breathe, I know how to do that. Everybody knows how to do that. But we breathe in, we breathe out because we have free will. You take your bus in the morning. Nobody comes to force you. It's your free will. You eat when you're hungry. You might decide I won't eat even though I'm hungry. But your free will makes you to decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to eat. And you dress yourself well before you go out of the house. It's your free will. If you don't want to dress, if you want to put on whatever, that uh, people will see their natural me of your body is your free will and the same thing the grace of God has come unto us the grace of God and salvation was not forced on us whosoever will may come and the strength in salvation was not forced on us we came he said be strong in the Lord and we decided I'm going to be strong in the Lord a free will is there and then if anybody wants to sin the free will is there too. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, it's a will. After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. You understand that? If, you know, the food is there, and then mommy says, come and eat, and for whatever reason may be, you are angry at her, and you are angry at yourself, and you say, I will not eat your food. And then you take that place of food, and you throw it away. That's your free will. And you did that willfully. Now when you are hungry, you cannot say, mommy, can I have food? I'm out of the kitchen already. And the one I give you, you throw it away. You see, the same thing. He, de he delivers us from sin. He saves us from sin. And if we decide that that sacrifice, we're going to rubbish that sacrifice. If we decide we're not going to take the benefit of that sacrifice anymore, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Look at the next uh, verse there, 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment. Now you are the one looking for the judgment. He doesn't want to judge you. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants you happy. He wants you holy. He wants you moving forward. 
But you said, no, I'm grounded. You're grounded yourself. No, I'm going to continue sin. That's your decision. And you're looking for judgment. He has not come to condemn. He has not come to judge. He has come to save. But you see, I'm looking for that judgment. All right, what you are looking for, you will get. Ask and thou shalt receive. See, can ye shall find, nor can it shall be opened unto you, but a certain fear for looking for of judgment and fairy indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now it's reserved for the adversaries. The Lord, in his own mind, he makes you an ambassador. He makes you a child of God. He makes you his offering. But you say, no, I abandon that. I want to fight. I want to fight. All right. But understand, when you make yourself an adversary of the Lord, that's your choice. That's judgment. That's fairy indignation. Verse 28. In verse 28, he that despises Moses' law died without mercy. Under two or three witnesses, verse 29, how of how much sorrow punishment. Suppose ye that he, he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God. You see that? That's not the will of God. That somebody who has been a believer is coming and now something got into him and he accepted that thing. Not Satan. Because if it's Satan that does something through you, God will punish that Satan. And if it's not your fault, it's not my fault, it's Satan. God will handle Satan all alone. But because this is man's choice and he has trodden underfoot, the son of God. How do you tread somebody under your foot? He's standing before you. He's pleading, I died for you. He's pleading, I died so that your sins will be taken away. He said, get out of my side. I am your savior. I am Jesus. I'm the son of God. And you push him down and you walk over him. You have trampled underfoot the son of God. Because you love your sin. And you love what you want to do more than the son of God standing before you. Look at this. And he has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He was sanctified. It was saved. It was set apart. It was sanctified. It was made holy by the blood of the covenant. But now, he counts that blood. Look at that. Look at that. It says, wherewith it was sanctified and an unholy thing. He counts that as unholy. But you said the blood was holy before. Yes, I said so before. I don't say that again. I don't accept that again. That the man he's choosing, that he is going to abandon the faith and abandon the grace of God. And I'm surprised the people who hear him say what he says and see him do what he does, they're still giving the respect of the old faithfulness. When he was standing, when he believed in Christ, when he was following Christ, they're still saying, brother, brother. They're still saying, reverend, reverend. And they're still saying, pastor, pastor, look at what he has done. Is trodden under the Son of God, and he has uh, counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and he has done despite to the Spirit of grace. And you know, did he still use all this title? And he still say, you know, brother, they still say, sister. Look at him, look at her, and look at even his facial appearance, and look at his defiance against 
the Lord Jesus and he gave the spirit of God. Look at verse 30. In verse 30 it says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And we look at verse 31 there. Verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall to the hands of the living God. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, you know, the free will is there. You become saved, your free will is still there. You're sanctified, your free will is still there. You become a minister, your free will is still there. And you become, you know, the highest of the ministers in your denomination, your free will is still there. And we need to subdue that free will. No, I will not do that. I'm a child of God, I will not go that direction. Make sure that your free will does not ruin your life. Now the just shall lay by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. It's when we stand on the ground of grace and when we stand by the virtue of faith he has pleasure in us but it's not forever if we draw back then it says my soul shall have no pleasure in him look at verse 39 verse 39 it says but we are not of them who draw back i didn't hear you amen it's a personal choice. Personal choice. When we know the path back to the dregs of the world, to the defilement of the world, but we we'll say, no, I am not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You'll keep on believing. Yeah. I believed yesterday. Today, I believe. I said today I believe the water I drank yesterday is not enough to quench the thirst of today. The food I ate yesterday is not enough to assuage and temper and remove the hunger I feel today. The faith I had yesterday is not enough to overcome the challenges of today. Every day I must believe. That's why it says we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen in your life. Amen. We we'll come to point number two. Point number two, the pattern and proclamation of faith in its fullness. We're looking at three things here. Number one, pleasing God through the obedience of faith. Number two, proclaiming the gospel for observance by the faithful. Number three, it says preventing the giants of the obstacles of fear. Look at number one. Number one is pleasing God through the obedience of faith. We're looking at um, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. The rapture is going to happen. Amen? Amen. But remember, remember, when he comes, the Son of Man, shall he find faith on the earth? Shall he find faith in your heart? Or is only activity, action? Or is only this, this, and that? But faith is missing the rapture will take away the people that still have faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that they should not see death, walk 
and that on that every day. There's so many things that will distract us from having faith. There's so many things that will jilt us. There's so many things that will test us. There's so many things that will try us. And then we forget the faith. We will say, you want to fight? Come on, I'll fight you. You want to do this? I'm ready for you. And then we abandon our faith. And you understand? To be translated and to have the rapture, we hold on to that faith. Any other thing that will come in our lives, or people don't want to fight, or they want to do this and that, so that they make us drop our faith, and we now begin to walk in the flesh, in violence, all that will hinder us from the rapture. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found because he had been translated. He had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. It's the faith we have in him. I trust him. He cannot disappoint me. I trust him. He's holding my hand. I trust him. I'm in the right place. I trust him. I walk by his power. I trust him. All the promises he had made for me, they are yes and amen, and I'm living by them. It's that faith that gets us ready. Anytime the Lord will come. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. Money does not please him. Self does not please him. The shouting does not please him. Speaking in tongues, good. But if that's all you do, you speak in tongues, you beat your wife. You speak in tongues, you steal church money. You speak in tongues and you do some lousy, lousy, feel the sin. All that does not please him. It is faith. The faith in him. The faith in the faithful. The faith and the finisher of our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe. He cometh to God for salvation. He must believe. He cometh to God for healing. He must believe. He cometh to God for new strength every day to run the race. He must believe. He cometh to God for sanctification, holiness. He must believe. He cometh to God for power in the Holy Ghost. He must believe. He cometh to God for renewal every day. The strength of the Lord renewed in his life every day. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know of our children, I mean real, real children, those uh, infants, and that is his pray. Mommy says pray. Pray every time, pray every day. Because it's in prayer we have our strength. And now your child is kneeling down and is shaking the head like this and turning like that. And is uh, putting the hand and looking through the openings of the fingers. Whether mommy is watching or not, that's not diligence. I said that to say this. The people, adults, who say they are praying. And they're seeking the Lord, and they, they're doing this, and then they open their eyes, they see what that fellow is doing there, and they're doing this, and all, and they're looking, and that's one, they're, you know, all, and they march, they march, but they're looking and watching. That's not seeking the Lord diligently. If you went to the governor and you wanted something from him, and you're doing like that, like a little child, like an infant, they'll not count you serious. The governor will say to, you know, the person, that, but why did you bring a man, a woman like this? He cannot even pay attention, and he's not even looking at me. He's not concentrating on what he wants. Why don't you understand that if God is going to bless us, the prayer and the faith is that we believe that he, the almighty God, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God's blessing will now multiply in your life. We're coming to number two. Number two is the pro proclaiming the gospel for the observance 
by the faithful. We're proclaiming the gospel. We're doing what the Lord has called us to do. And we expect that the faithful in the land, that they will obey the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 24, by faith, Moses, think about that. Moses couldn't have done everything he did except by faith. Moses, here am I. I've seen the affliction of the children of Israel and I've come to deliver them. Get up and go to that same Egypt that you ran away from that will take faith to go back there. And go tell Pharaoh to appear before Pharaoh. Remember, he left when the daughter of Pharaoh had adopted him, that he would be king because the lady couldn't be a king and he absconded. He ran away. I don't want that. I want to suffer affliction with the people of God. And he comes to that same place that takes faith. And go tell Pharaoh, let my son go. And Pharaoh said, Moses, Aaron, you keep the people from their work. You want them lazy. I want them to build for me. And you are saying that they should go. Don't come here again. And he came again. When they drove you out and they say, they don't want gospel here. They don't want preaching here. They don't want righteousness, salvation here. And the Lord said, go back. And you go back. That is faith. And then eventually with all those miracles performed, they let you go. And now they were by the Red Sea. And look at Pharaoh and his chariots coming. And you are still standing there. And you are telling the children of Israel, fear not. The Egyptians you see today, you'll see them no more. That's faith. And when God said, why are you crying unto me? Stretch your rod. Rod, look at the sea. It will drown everyone. But it says, stretch your rod. And he stretched the rod. And the rod parted. Will you be God if he told you to do something like that? Unscientific. And just stretch the rod. He did by faith. And then they came over like you will come over. Yeah. No sea will drown you. No sea will drown your ministry. It's all by faith. And God said, look back. And the Egyptians were coming. They were in the middle of the Red Sea. Say, stretch your rod again. Rod, that's all you have. What's in your hand, God will use to perform a miracle. He said, the rod and the water closed up on them. They sang. They came to the next chapter after their singing. At the end of that chapter 15, the water was bitter. They couldn't drink. And the children of Israel began to murmur. And Moses said, what am I going to do? Look at that tree. A representation of the cross of Christ when he comes. Throw it into that river and Mara bitter will turn to sweet. The cross of Jesus will turn every bitterness of your life into sweetness in Jesus' name. And it was so, and it was so. And the Lord made a covenant with them. And he came to the next chapter. What are we going to eat? Now you made us leave Egypt. Where is breakfast? Where is lunch? And God said, he'll give manna all by faith. And he went and the Amalekites came against them, chapter 17. And again, they overcame. Every chapter, every step of the way, it was by faith. Every day in your life, you'll overcome. Yeah. Every challenge that comes to you, you'll overcome. Yeah. By faith. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You cannot enjoy the provisions of Calvary 
and enjoy the pleasures of sin at the same time. One has to go. If the purity of the cross is rejected, then you have your pleasures of sin. But if you are going to enjoy the provision of the cross and the provision of Calvary, the provision of Christ, you have to abandon the pleasures of sin. Look, of, uh, the pleasures of sin. Look at verse 26. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of in Egypt. You understand what that means? It's like, um, you know, you've taken your bath, but you've not robbed the pomade and, you know, whatever, uh, to make you look uh, good, beautiful, and handsome. But insult comes because of your faith. Insult comes because of your preaching. And the insult comes because of your ministry. And you take that insult and you rub it on yourself because you enjoy it. They insult me because of Christ. They, are, they reproach me because of Christ. I take that like pomade and I rub it like this and I rub it on my and I say, thank you, Jesus. I can suffer reproach with you. That's how Moses saw everything that came because he esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Verse 27, in verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured a seeing him. Tell me. Who is invisible. When he was in Egypt, he saw Pharaoh and he saw the fury. He didn't really see him or look at him. He saw the invisible God. He saw those magicians that are going to perform and replicate and reproduce the miracle that the Lord performed. He didn't look at the magicians, he looked at his God as seeing him who is invisible. And yet comes Pharaoh. And he pointed his uh, dangerous finger at uh, Moses. And you could see on his face, don't come here again. He didn't see the man. He didn't see the anger. He saw the presence of the invisible. And the Amalekites that came and behind the army of the children of Israel, they were going to destroy everyone. He didn't see the Amalekites. He saw him who is invisible. You know our problem? We see people too much. We don't see God, the invisible one. Somebody is threatening us. We hear him more than we hear the God of heaven who says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. We saw a bully that will bully us down and shout us down. We didn't see God. We're looking at the bully and we're trembling and shaking. Our problem is we see dangerous people here on earth too often, too much. We gaze at them and as we gaze at them, it looks like their furious eyeballs are stronger and greater than the um, fav favorable eyes of the Lord. But the reason why the worthies of old had success is because every time they could endure a seeing him who is invisible. He will never leave you. Amen. He will never forsake you. Amen. Whatever you see of this world, look away and see the invisible. Amen. You will always have the victory in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three is preventing the giants of the obstacles of faith. Preventing the giants. Yes, there were giants in the land. And there are still giants in the land. And the giants have just one goal. That's the people of God will not get to their inheritance. And if we look at those giants, uh, never, never 
even pick up the courage to move on and get to our inheritance. They heard that Joshua was coming. And all those kings made a confederacy. And they said, let him come. Or show him we are being kind of forceful, violent, fighting soldiers from our youth. And Joshua still went all by faith. They passed through the Red Sea by faith. They passed through Jordan all by faith. They passed through. And those Jericho walls came down all by faith. And these things were written for our learning. That if we just believe the Lord, there are no giants on earth that can hinder us in Jesus' name. <laughs> giants may brag, that's who they are. Giants may boast, that's who they are. They would say, give me one man there. If he's able to conquer me, then you conquer us. We will be your servant. If I conquer him... And that was actually his emphasis because he failed. Anyone they brought, he will conquer that individual. And they say, why are you watching? Are you not the followers of Saul? Here I'm the giant and I come. Give me one man. Okay, we'll give you one man. We'll even give you somebody who's not a full man yet, just a boy. We'll give you somebody who does not have the strength to carry any sword. We'll give you somebody who does not have an armor bearer. We'll give you somebody who does not have the experience of even uh, waging war and having the victory. And here comes David. What? Did you hear what I said? Give me one man. And you give this little boy, you want to waste his life, he became more angry. You know, these people who overcame in the Old Testament, they didn't fear the anger of anyone, the shouting of anyone, the sword of anyone, the spear of anyone, the armor bearer of anyone. We're too fearful of our neighbors. What you fearful of? Even people were familiar with that man lives, you know, that side. And we even fear his driver more than we, you know, fear God. And uh, that, that woman, they said, if a woman has a beard and is growing a beard here, they said that shows you, you, she said, you understand. And once you look at a woman and she has some air here, ah, you are trembling. They will kill me. <laughs> Who can kill you? When Satan, their master, cannot kill you, there are servants that have no power. How can they kill you? They come in the dream. And they have come. They have come. You understand? If somebody is bold, let him come during the day. Those who come in the dream, if they're not, they are cowards. <laughs> and they say, I will finish you. Tell them, when we wake up, you come. <laughs> and I, when I mention the name of Jesus, you'll be nowhere to be found. It's the fear that we have of that man, of that woman. It's our own fear that kills us. Not their power, no. Not their ability, no. It's our own fear that paralyzes us. And any time, you can throw that fear away. It belongs to the devil. Send it back to the sender. And when you do that, you stand firm by faith. You prevent all those giants, the obstacles of fear, everything gone in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 29, it says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying and trying to do, were drowned. Your enemies cannot copy you. I said your enemies cannot copy you. 
Look at Pharaoh. You know, great men can be foolish, thoughtless. Great armies can be foolish, thoughtless. They said, look at the sea opening. They had never seen any, anything like that before. Instead of uh, praising God and saying, we'll serve this God that can open the Red Sea for the children of Israel. They said, what Israel can do, Egypt can do. I hear you. And where Israel can walk, Egypt can walk there. I hear you. They're digging their own graves. And then they said, Pharaoh said, let's go. Be careful how you obey the commandment of somebody who wants to perish. He wants to perish and he says, let go. Let's go. Me, I'm not going with Pharaoh. I will stand where I stand. I will watch him get to the midst of that red sea. Are you not coming? Uh-uh. You go first. You will not follow them. And they tried to do that. They were drowned. I'm still alive. I am not drowned. You know why? I didn't follow Pharaoh into the Red Sea. Don't follow them. I said, don't follow them. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, it tells us by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. All those walls that tried to prevent you from your inheritance, all the walls will fall down. After they compassed about seven days. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not. Give me a good amen. amen. As it was, so it is. Jesus said, the harlots, they go into the kingdom of God before the Pharisees. The harlots were the people that knew they were sinners. And they confessed, accepted they were sinners. The other people, the self-righteous people in the land, I'm better than that harlot. If anybody is to perish, she would perish, but I will not perish. It is not by self-righteousness, it is by faith. If a harlot comes and he says, I'm sorry for what I've done, I believe in the Lord Jesus now, she'll be saved. If a profligate comes and he says, my life has been wasted, but now I believe in Christ, immediately he'll be saved. What the people that are saying, I'm a good man, I'm a good woman, I've been going to church all my life, I pay the pastor's deal, I pay my, you know, tithes and offering, I'm not like these people, they don't believe on the Lord Jesus, they believe only in their so-called good works, they will perish. But you will not perish. Yeah. By faith, the harlot Rahab perish not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And look at verse 32. It says, And what shall I more say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson. Samson. What am I looking at? Samson. Somebody help me. What do you say there? Uh, you know. There are people that talk, that person backslid, that person backslid, so was something. But then uh, the Spirit of God came back again. Faith came back again. And attachment to the Lord came back again. You know, the people that I don't backslide, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I'm always proper, I'm always like this. They don't have the power, but something came back. If you are backsliding today, you'll come back. Yeah. The same old power will come upon your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. You know, something, something is left on. Uh -huh, tell me the story. And then he shaved his head. Tell me the story. And he lost all his power. Tell me the story. The New Testament said that all that something did, everything went of the sea. And it's uh, swept away. But now, by faith, something. By faith, yourself there. Yeah. Whatever your past, faith 
will rewrite a new story about you. It is not what we were. It is what we are by faith today. And it is the faith that will wipe away the past, wipe away the guilt, wipe away the condemnation by faith. What will I most say? To so talk about Gideon, talk about Barak, talk about something, talk about Jephthah or David also and Samuel and the prophets. The Lord is talking about them because of their faith. Heaven will talk about you because of your faith. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Stopped the mouths of lions. A lion is on the street. Go there. Stop his mouth. A lion is waiting for me on the evangelistic field. Go there and stop their mouth. A lion is waiting. I want to make progress. I want to run. I want to walk. I want to fly. I want to do the will of God. But a lion is waiting there. In the case of Daniel, not just one lion. Lions, lions, lions. And those lions were hungry. And they said, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. He said, go ahead. I want to prove God more. Prove God more. And then they threw him there. And um, the, you know, the lions, they welcomed him. And he laid down like that. And he never had any kind of mattress like that to sleep on in his life. And he slept well. And the king came and the king said, Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve able to deliver you? And some, um, Daniel replied, he said, Lay forever, O king. Don't mind that. That's what they always say to them. They don't live forever, but you know, that's the normal thing they tell them. And that's what they wanted to hear. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth. Have the angels all died off? The angels are ministers to those of us who are heirs of salvation. And then the king said, Daniel, come forth. You will come forth. Yeah. And he came out. And some people say, you know, the secret, those lions were not hungry at that time. And because they are not hungry, and also they, you know, they, they, are, they are eating so much that they slept in the night. That's why they didn't, uh, you know, crush uh, Daniel. All right, all right. All those people that said the lions were not hungry, and that's why they didn't devour Daniel. Can you try your luck? <laughs> and then they threw them there. Lo and behold, when those people, when they arrived, and the lions said, meat has come, meat has come, meat has come. The unbeliever is meat for the lion. The righteous, your blood, it will be poison to those lions. And the lions knew that is poison. Don't eat that one. Let him go. Our food will come. When you are there, they will not eat you up. After you are gone, their food will come. Faith. Faith in the Lord. Did who by faith wrought righteousness and subdued kingdoms and obtained promises and stopped the mouth of lions. Now, how did he stop their, their mouth? He didn't shout. He didn't call heaven down. He didn't call fire down. He just quietly, you know, you can be quiet and have faith. Without saying anything, the silent faith. The shouting faith. When you are around the walls of Jericho, you can have shouting faith. When you are in the lion's den, as you breathe in faith, as you breathe out faithfulness, as you breathe in obedience, as you breathe, as you breathe out overcoming power, silently your faith will keep on walking in Jesus' name. 
you are in the office, you are somewhere, and you feel a sharp pain there. And it's not a place where you can shout, in Jesus' name, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Well, that place, that's not a place for shouting, silent faith. But your breath going in, your breath going out, that pain I command you, get out of there. And that silent faith will work. And no lion, no giant will ever eat you up in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, number, point number three now. Point number three is our, uh, our perseverance in possession of faith in the finisher. We're looking at three things here. Number one, number one is patiently running. The race by the faith of the Son. Number two is progressively reaching all regions as followers of the Son. And number three is perseveringly um, racing the righteous in the fullness of the Son. We're looking at number one. Number one, now patiently running the race by the faith of the Son. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. Let us lay aside. Look up here. If you are traveling and uh, you are allowed a bag, uh, baggage and that baggage must wear this uh, kind of many kilos or pounds. And as you are packing, you try to lift that. And it's heavier than they will accept as you are flying. As you are going to your great destination, then you say, I have to remove some things. You remove this, you remove that, and your weight again is still greater than they will allow to go with you in the flight. You remove enough, and then you lift it up now. This is good now. Now we're running a race, and we're going on a journey, and our load can be too heavy. Our load can be too overpowering. And when you see that at the beginning of the journey, I have to remove this, I have to remove that, make that load light enough so that you will be able to travel light. That's what you say, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight <clears throat> every weight and it says and the sin which so easily beset us and let us run where we run yeah. with the race that is set before us as you are you know running the race you understand you must not have any property of satan in your baggage it will make it too heavy. And you will not be able to run very well. What's the property of Satan there? Sin is. Sin. If there is anger, anger comes from the devil. And it becomes too heavy. And you cannot run at light. See, all those, uh, you know, terrible, terrible things that people do transgression. If you have them inside, you cannot. It is atrocity. All the atrocities of the world and the things that the worldly people do, if you put it there, it will be too weighty. Nothing is. If you put it there, while you are running, you, they, it will be so heavy, you cannot even carry, you cannot even walk, you cannot even stand with all those uh, things of Satan in the baggage. But you take them away, and now you will run. You will cross every sea. You will fly over every mountain. 
you will be springing in your heart. The joy of the Lord and the victory of the cross will belong to you. You will be an overcomer in Jesus' name. Look at verse 2. In verse 2. <clears throat> God bless you. Thank you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. When you are driving a vehicle, make sure that all the parts are genuine. All the spare parts are genuine. Should in case the car is breaking down on the road. And then you bring the spare parts and you fix it in. Make sure it is genuine. But the people that do not have the faith that comes from the author and from the finisher, from Christ. When they fix it in, it's fake. It does not work. Your faith will work. Amen. And it says, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're running a race. You are running a race. You will run well. And you run to the finishing line in Jesus' name. Whatever you have heard hinders others like you. Those things will not hinder you. But every time, every day you wake up, you check your baggage. There's anything that will weigh you down. Anything that will hinder your prayer. Anything that will remove the wheel from your car of faith. Anything that will ground you. Before you go out, remove all those things. Tell the Lord, confess it to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going on, I'm continuing my journey today. Remove this, remove this, and remove this, and let me walk by faith all through my days in Jesus' name. Every one of us will get to the finishing line. You, where are you? I'll see you on the finishing line. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at progressively reaching our regions as followers of the sun. Progressively, 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 you'll be making progress. Well, we'll hear stories about you. Good story. Amen. Good testimony. Amen. Where you were yesterday, you finished the work there, you are here on the new ground today in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 42. In Luke chapter 4, verse 42, and when it was day, he departed and went into the desert place and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. Look at verse 43. In verse 43, and he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. Other cities also. For therefore am I sent. The Lord has sent you. It will be a successful ministry. And then you go to other cities, other cities, other cities also. If you've established ministry and church in this place, after this day is the time to now move on. Progress. Higher ground. And the grace that saw you through in this city, when you get to the next city, that same grace will see you through. Yeah. Your life will not be limited. Yeah. My brother, my sister, your ministry will not be limited. Yeah. You've done it here, go and do it in the next city. You've done that, go and do it in the next city. You will not be tired. Yeah. You will not be weary. Like the Lord Jesus Christ, you follow him to the regions beyond. We're looking at uh, number three here. Number three is perseveringly racing the righteous to the fullness of the Son. 
Raising the righteous to the fullness of the son. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 11, and he gave, and he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and he gave some evangelists, and he gave some pastors and teachers. Look at us here. On the front row, we come and we give the program. He gave some. We come to the side here, a choir there, and we give uh, the program. If they miss anybody out, what do you do? You raise up your hand. I'm here. Are you there? When you say I'm here, oh, you have not got and give you your own. And we come to this side, the side of Camp Choir, and uh, you know, we give, we give. If they miss you out, what do you do? You raise up your hand. I am here. Heaven will recognize you. And then at the back there, he gives some. He gives some. Now, he's giving everyone. Not everyone receives the same thing. He gives some apostle, receive. He gives some prophets, receive. He gives some evangelists, receive. He gives some pastors, receive. He gives some teachers, receive. When we receive, you know, sometimes those five the fivefold ministry. Maybe you've heard me before illustrate the thumb, that's the apostle. The pointing finger down at the man that is the prophet. And the middle finger, the one that goes beyond everyone that is the evangelist. And this one, where you put your wedding ring, that's the pastor. The preacher, the minister of love. And this one, where you put, which you put inside your ear, whenever something is scratching you there, that the teacher that puts the message inside your ear. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, you may not start at the top. When we started my little ministry, his ministry that he called me to, in 1973, he gave me a teacher. And then after administering in the teacher's office, he gave me pastoral. After that, I only did teaching and pastoring, teaching and pastoring. And when the pastoral ministry came, he didn't cancel the teaching ministry. And then he gave me the evangelist. And now I can go on the field. The teacher is still there. The prophet, uh, the, the pastor is still there. The evangelist has now come. And then after the evangelist, I was even thinking, when you have three out of five, that's 60%. And that's good. That's past mark. And God says, I'm not through with you yet. He's not through with you yet. And then he gave me the prophetic ministry. And I say, there's somebody there, you have this problem, stand up. And then I pray, and the problem is solved. And now he gave me apostolic ministry. God has not finished with you. Say, he has not finished with me. Whatever he has given you, he wants to give something more today. Something greater today. Something higher today. Why? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for the, uh, for the perfecting of the saints for the work 
of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, when God has given you the gift, when you see imperfection in your church, you're not criticized. You will not run away. How are you going to perfect their imperfection if you run away? When you see any imperfection, you're not to complain, you're not to blame people, you're not to criticize people, and you're not to beat people down. Say, ah, I know now why God sent me to that conference. I know now why God gave me this gift. It's for the perfecting of the saints. It's for the work of the ministry. It's for the defying of the body of Christ. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, till we all come. Till we all come. Say that with me. It's not just me alone. It, they say what well, God has brought him until he comes. No, you and I. You and I. I said you and I. We all, until we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. Welcome there. Unto a perfect man will get there. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We'll get there. Yeah. Every day, every little addition, every day, every little multiplication, every day, every little realization, every day, every little demonstration, we're moving on, we're moving on, we're moving on until I, until you, until we all come in the unity of the faith. Our faith is going to grow. And our faith is going to work. And then we come to a perfect man together. And it says unto the measure of the fullness of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I welcome you to a new level today. I welcome you to a new life today. I welcome you to a new possession today. We are coming higher. You are coming higher. Where are you? Get up and tell the Lord. Tell the Lord you are getting there. He gave some. It's giving you your own. You will not go empty handed. He lift you higher. Take you greater. Than the place you had ever been in your life. Don't mind what happened yesterday. Don't mind what happened today. Don't mind where you are now. Higher ground. High, higher ground. You are getting there. Anything in your baggage. That's from the other side. Sin, anger, transgression, atrocities, naughtiness, anything that will weigh you down. Remove them, remove them, remove them. And continue in this journey of faith. You are going to run faster now. You are going to go higher now. 
the calling of God upon your life will be without repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. He has answered your prayer. Everything you have asked him, he has given you. Your life will take on new brightness. New anointing. New power. Where you failed before you will not fail again where you fell before you will not fall again higher ground greater ground the lord confirm in your life in your ministry in your family in your church in your profession in jesus name it's of that hand the hand of a conqueror. Amen. The hand of brother Victor, sister Victoria. Amen. The Lord has lifted you up. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. we thank you for everything we have learned. We pray you take every fear away from every life in Jesus' name. Amen. A new kind of faith. New power of faith. New progress through faith. Grant to everyone in Jesus name. The grace to build. The grace to preach. The grace to pray. The grace to progress. The grace for service sufficient grace grant to everyone in Jesus name the grace to remove every pebble every stone every hindrance and every every wage grace to remove everything without any sluggishness give everyone in Jesus name the grace to run. The grace to preach. The grace to sing. The grace to do more for your glory. Give everyone in Jesus name. We are the people of God. We are crossing the Red Sea. Nobody here will be left behind. We as the people of God were conquering all the Amalekites. Amen. Nobody here will be left behind. Amen. We, the people of God, were crossing River Jordan. Amen. You will not be left behind in Jesus' name. Amen. We as the people of God were running around our Jericho walls. All the Jericho walls before you will fall down flat. We are possessing the promised land. And the fruit of the land now belongs to you. Lord, give something definite. A call. An anointing. The power. The teacher. The pastor. The evangelist. The prophet, Amen. the apostle, Amen. give something that feeds the ministry you have called us to in Jesus' name. Amen. Your hands are no more empty. Amen. Your heart no more empty. 
the word of your mouth no more empty your ministry no more empty your bank of account account of the bank of heaven in your life no more empty lord give everyone sufficient to make progress in the ministry confirm it lord in every life in jesus name we pray